Diversity Executive Council, um, trying to create a culture where diversity is valued, and, and it's certainly important to us as a readiness issue. Um, everything that we do is focused on readiness. We made progress, uh, but there's certainly more to do. So we have to move beyond having onlys in our organization. So there are bright spots. We have our first F-35 fighter pilot woman candidate. Um, I have, just last month, we recruited our first female enlistment into a combat arms unit. Um, there's a whole lot of subtleties to that. That's significant uh, for us. Um, we really struggled to make that happen because of some of the obstacles that the Department of the Army uh, kind of put <coughs> in that process. And I can talk a little more about that later. But to get at that, we have to grow the next generation of women as senior leaders. And you'll see in the gender report, we, uh, right. when, when Christina talks about it, we've got some, again, bright spots. We're making progress. But in order to create more opportunities, I need more women to join the Guard. And then we can start shaping careers and actually change uh, the climate and the direction of the organization. Part of that requires mentorship. And I talked to some of the members of the Guard, male and female. And I think we all agree that mentorship doesn't have a gender. So for us, and I think that came out of the Women's Forum, the um, issues we face are soldier issues and, and airmen issues. And probably less focusing on medical issues. Obviously, we know that's part of the discussion. But what I found healthy during the breakouts, uh, and a lot of the feedback I got was the discussion, not by me, not directed by me, of its own accord became about soldiers and airmen. So it was a very service-focused conversation, which I thought was healthy. So we have the objective of our Equal Opportunity Program, and that's to formulate, direct, and sustain a comprehensive effort that ensures fair treatment of all members based on merit, fitness, and capability that, again, supports readiness. So as, as part of this, one of, the thing, uh, one of the things I did when I was actually in the Human Resources Office is to move towards competency-based hiring. So that aligns with what the Office of Personnel Management directs. <clears throat> what we're working on next, that aligns to the technician workforce. In essence, you are interviewing based on competencies. All the questions are focused on competencies. It takes out, it mitigates anyway, some of the bias, and it gets at the perception of cronyism because you're hiring based on what the person is best qualified to do. So we've seen that work well for us on the technician side. I think the, le the logical extension of that is to, is to put that into the active guard and reserve of workforce. So we'll continue to uh, pursue that within the human resources realm. So we have the, uh, a very robust sexual harassment and assault response program, and, and we know that that significantly helps survivors. Policies uh, have established accountability processes and safety networks for advocacy. But what I've seen, and this is just my perspective, is the focus is not, it's all on response, not all on response. We need to focus more on prevention. And I looked at the DOD report. Um, and it's one of my takeaways from there, and I can let any of my subject matter experts in here. When it comes to climate, um, what I learned in reading through the DOD reports is that the precursor for sexual assault is sexual harassment. So if we can fix the climate and eliminate the sexual harassment, I think that will have a positive impact on preventing sexual assault from happening. <clears throat> so there are issues related to combating sexism, improving our gender equality. They are a priority for the overall readiness. And again, for us, uh, in my role in particular, we, we have to address anything that impacts readiness. I can't have any type of corrosive uh, conduct in the organization. Uh, the damage it does is it's, it's hard to overcome. So here's what we have done. So within probably a week of being in the job, I published a command philosophy. And I, I have copies of that if you're interested. Uh, the bottom line is just how we're going to do business. This is what I do, and then the alignment by subordinate commanders should be the same. Provided expectations of conduct counseling uh, to all members of the National Guard, and, and that includes me. My counseling came from the governor. I sent that down to him, and he put it or whatever his, uh, his spit on it, and that's fine. If I'm expecting it of my subordinates, then it should at least be expected of me. Uh, we initiated, initiated a joint status of discipline briefing to review investigation and adjudication of disciplinary issues. So historically, a lot of these matters get retained at the senior level. And this is the best practice that I actually <clears throat> poached from the Air Guard. The Air Guard does it. 
I'm thinking, well, if the Air Guard does it, why are we doing this as a joint venture? And I would like to take it a step further. And rather than retain the status of discipline, meaning they review the processes and adjudication of, of disciplinary matters, well, why are we sharing that? Why would I keep it to myself? Why would I not share that with the legislature, with our stakeholders? I would have to redact it, certainly. But I think there's an element here, a deterrent factor, if on active duty they call it the blotter, then military police will publish a, a redacted report. A soldier from X organization was arrested for DUI. Stay off the blotter. So I think that will have some, uh, and it also informs the organization that we're not just sitting on our hands here. Somebody's paying attention. And then just today, uh, very briefly, um, was able to testify we're pursuing legislation to establish a provost marshal position within the National Guard. That boils down each state's construct is a little bit different. Uh, for us, I view that as a compliance officer position. Um, in the end, it becomes a level three certified state law, law enforcement officer and a state law enforcement uh, certified non-commissioned officer um, as the assistant provost marshal. We don't have that, um, and have not. We have a director of military support. But there's a linkage there that I don't believe we have. And that, I think, having somebody who has arrest authority and some investigative capability, and certainly when it comes to compliance and abiding by policy and regulation, that makes sense to me. And now you don't lose track of somebody or that investigative capability again becomes a deterrent. Because sometimes what happens on the civil side, we don't know about it. Even though we have a duty to report, policies are great. But if nobody abides, then Somebody gets picked up for UI in New York City, I, I don't know about it. Not until till far down the road. So that, I think, will help. I just published a memorandum, and again, I, I have a copy I can certainly provide. Uh, identifying our responsibility in preventing sexual assault and uh, noting the results of this legislative report to the entire organization. Don't know that we've done that before. We published it, Christina. Have we actually sent that out to the force before? No, sir. So that, that's, again, uh, I'm going after the prevention and, and deterrence of this type of conduct. And uh, lastly, I've asked for an organizational assessment of the Vermont National Guard. Um, inclusive in this, the foundation element is an organization climate assessment. We do climate assessments. We've asked subordinate commanders to do this as a matter of regulation. We've done climate assessments in the past. I think we've struggled with finding closure for some of the issues that were identified. So that's great. That's a foundation element. But this organizational assessment is done by National Guard Bureau, or facilitated by National Guard Bureau. They bring in members from our sister states, and they uh, basically focus on what I've asked them to focus on, which is hiring practices and policies, sexual harassment, sexual assault, our policies and regulations that, uh, that drive that. Um, but I think it's going to be very healthy for us. Uh, it's, we've never done it before. So it's AIR, it's Army. Um, in addition to the climate assessment, it's individual interviews uh, with every, organ, every command, every section, every staff director, at least elements thereof. In the end, it comes with findings, it comes with recommendations, and the report is releasable to the public. And that's my intent. And when do you anticipate that? Uh, it should be completed in May, ma'am. So this is not a, a short-term project. This is a significant undertaking. Oh. So, uh, the, by that final report, I will obviously um, give that to the governor for his review. Uh, but in the end, it's, it's my intent is to release it to the public. This just makes sense to me. Um, anyway, I'd like to introduce Christina, <coughs> unless you have any questions for me. Uh, Christina Lazell uh, is a subject matter expert, um, and she's just wonderful for us as an organization. And uh, I'll let her walk through the actual legislative report and, and the format. We might, as we go yes, along, but, but you, Greg, you suggested that you had your um, position paper. It wasn't your position paper. It was a better thing. Command philosophy? Yes, yes your command philosophy. I'd like to have had that in my family. But anyway, <laughs> I, uh, I would love to have, to yes, have you share that. If Absolutely. Because you, know, yeah. you said, would we? And the answer is yes, we would. I will make sure you have that before we leave. Because you set the tone for the whole operation. Yes, ma'am. That's the idea. Thank you. Thank you. Let's swap. <laughs> Christopher. So, good afternoon. As uh, 
was stated already, I'm Christina Lozell, I'm the State Sexual Assault Response Coordinator. I will be covering both the sexual assault and the sexual harassment piece, as well as the gender report. Um, I also serve as an equal opportunity leader for my unit, and I'm EEO counselor for the full-time course, so I can help uh, federal technicians through the process of reporting uh, EO complaints. And I also am the LGBT Pride Program Manager for one of our special emphasis programs. So um, that's kind of my background and who I am. Do you have many hats? I do. Keep turning them around? <laughs> yes. Um, I also uh, drill weekends. I am a behavioral health specialist for the Army National Guard. So that's what I do on drill weekends. <laughs> <laughs> um, so good afternoon again. Thank you for having us here for our annual report. Um, today I'll be talking you through the report, but please feel free to ask questions as we go. Same deal as we've done in the past. Um, I've, this report is divided into four main chapters, uh, which is first the executive summary, then we'll go over some reports, our organizational assessment, and the addendum. During this brief, I plan to cover the first three chapters, and then we can refer into the addendum as needed or if questions come up and there's answers in there. So this report looks at fiscal year 19, which goes from October 1st of 2018 through September 30th of 2019. And during that time, the Vermont National Guard had approximately 3,300 members. Of those members, about 920 of them were full-timers, and the rest were the traditional drill status guardsmen. In fiscal year 19, the sexual assault response coordinator tracked three reports of sexual assault which occurred within fiscal year 19 that also had members of the Vermont National Guard as the accused offender. Uh, one case we had was a civilian survivor, and then the remaining six cases involved military members as survivors, but they occurred in previous fiscal years. Uh, in addition, the Equal Opportunity and Diversity Office received two sexually offensive incident reports that those are basically situations where they don't rise to the level of a sexual harassment or EO complaint, but they're sex-based in nature and the leadership handles it at the lowest level. And we received no reports of discrimination or bullying or hazing based on sexual orientation. Uh, so before I go into the report, we wanted to review the definitions. That way, when we go further in and we're having these conversations, you can understand what I'm actually speaking about when we go. So there is a difference between the military and the state definition of sexual assault, so it's important to differentiate between what those are. The military's definition of sexual assault encompasses five categories, which is rape, sexual assault, aggravated sexual contact, abusive sexual contact, and forcible sodomy, um, as well as attempts to commit these acts. So even if they didn't complete the act, if they were trying to, we can also hold them accountable for that. Um, there's further detail into that definition on page one and page 15. Um, and then also the Vermont state statute includes felony crimes of sexual assault, aggravated sexual assault, and other crimes which are related to sex-based offenses against minors. Uh, there is a newer statute, Title, 30, or Title 13, Section 2601A, which established that misdemeanor, uh, which is kind of similar to the military's definition of abusive sexual contact. So it helped to bring the state statute more in line with the Department of Defense definition, but the DOD definition still provides a, brighter, uh, a broader construct of language. Uh, so it allows us to take action on a few more um, acts than under civilian law. So also, when a survivor comes forward, they're allowed the option to choose which type of report they make. We have a restricted report or an unrestricted report. So regardless of which report they choose to make, all survivors are um, they have the ability to access counseling, medical, legal, and advocacy services. So the main difference between those two types of reports is that an unrestricted report involves an investigation by local law enforcement or the Office of Complex Investigations, which is a group from National Guard Bureau of specially trained judge advocates or those that have a law enforcement background that are trained in sexual assault investigations specifically. So they're outside of the organization. Um, and then a restricted report is the one that remains confidential. So I, my office or the wing SART is, are the only ones who have access to the names involved in those cases. Um, there's also another subcategory of an unrestricted report, which is called open with limited. That's the situation where it was a Vermont National Guard service member who assaulted a civilian, or the situation where there's a third party who becomes aware of an assault and they go to command to report it. So we don't have an actual victim signing the reporting statement, but we are made aware that there was a report, so we 
track it through the local law enforcement or through a command-directed investigation. And then when we're talking about sexual harassment, that's a form of sex-based discrimination that involves unwanted sexual advances, requests for sexual favors, or other verbal and physical conduct of a sexual nature. And then more information on to the policy and the definition on that can be found on page 22 in the addendum. So another new definition that we included this year was that sexually offensive incidents that I talked about a little bit earlier. That refers to the physical or verbal incidents that are perceived to be sexual in nature, but they don't fall under the definition of sexual harassment. So it allows us to hold people accountable for those lower level offenses. Um, examples of this could be those, um, those comments or those jokes that have an undertone of sex-based like sex content. Um, or uh, unwanted physical contact or gestures that don't rise to the level again. Uh, for more information on that policy, please see page 25. So later in the report, you're, are, so you will also see a reference to an informal and formal resolution request. Both of those are reviewed by the National Guard Bureau following an investigation of unlawful discrimination by an aggrieved party. But the primary difference between a formal and informal complaint just has to do with the timelines for administrative actions to be taken. And if the, uh, if the resolution request was made in writing or not, an informal complaint, <clears throat> sorry, an informal complaint is not made in writing and a formal complaint is done in writing. Um, so now we're gonna go into chapter two, which is the reports. It starts on page three. And so just a little bit of a history is that uh, the National Defense Authorization Act from FY11 requires that the Secretary of Defense submits an annual report on sexual assaults uh, that involve service members of the armed service during the preceding year. So this chart reflects the reporting information submitted by the Vermont National Guard through the Defense Sexual Assault Incident Database, or DSET, from FY19. So the graph represents each of the reports that we received in FY19 the color represents the report, uh, the type of assault that was reported, and then each column is the type of report. So the first row is our restricted report. We had two examples of abusive sexual contact and one that was unknown or the survivor didn't um, report what type of assault it was. Uh, the other thing to note about this chart is that the red circles tell you if it was a Vermont National Guard service member who committed the offense or is the accused offender. And then if there is not a red circle, it means that it was somebody outside of the Vermont National Guard as the offender. So it could be um, an active duty member or an, a civilian who committed the assault. So the Sexual Assault Prevention Response Program began in 2010. So the reports that we received in FY19 one of those incidents occurred before FY 2010, so before the program was in place. Three of them occurred between 2010 and 2018, and then as I've stated, three of them were within FY 19. So we're starting to close out all of those historical reports and get more to um, real-time reporting as an incident occurs. They're reporting closer to the incident happening. Which brings us into page four. There's two graphs which were um, included to kind of address the request for information from last year to show our historical data so you can see what the trends are across the entire program's history rather than just a snapshot of this year. So the first graph shows you which report an incident, or which, re which fiscal year a report was made in. So we've received the seven reports in FY19 and then back in 2010 when the program began, we had only received one report. The second graph shows you which year the incident actually occurred in. So the assaults actually occurred in the years on the bottom chart, but they were reported in the years in the top chart. So you can see we've had reports all the way back to 1981, which was way before the program was created. So the service member felt comfortable coming forward and reporting to us something happened to them and they were ready to get services. So then if we look over on page... Sorry, I have a question. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, so Christine, the 1981 re report, do you have a statute of limitations in the, in the, in the military? No, ma'am. They can come forward. There's no statute. Um, 
if there's an assault that happened right however long mm -hmm. ago they can come forward whenever they feel ready So then we'll move on to page five, which is full of wonderful charts. Um, the first two charts provide additional information into the restricted and unrestricted reports that we received in FY19. So for instance, if we look at that first chart, it's all of our restricted reports that we received. The first one is case 00012. You can see if you go along, the incident year was 2017, and the survivor was a Vermont National Guard female who was an E4, or the fourth rank on the enlisted track. And the accused offender at the time was also a Vermont National Guard service member. He was a male E8 at the time. The type of assault that was reported was the abuse of sexual contact. And then we have the LOD is the next line. A LOD is a line of duty determination, which is a formal process that affirms that the injury was incurred on a military status. It's most of the time used to determine the VA's eligibility for uh, disability rating. <coughs> So, uh, I can't remember if you're Christine or Christina. Christina. Christina, that's what Christina. I Okay, I knew that. Um, so the E4 and the E8, um, I assume then it begins at the bottom and you work your way up. <coughs> so that we can assume, as we look at those numbers, that the power differential yes. is each case. Yes, ma'am. So you can see that the survivors um, tend to be lower ranking, but that is not always the case. If you look through the unrestricted chart, so the second chart there, you can see that there is a There's a single to, case of yeah. equal yes. rank. Yes, and there's <coughs> one where it, um, it also tends to be that it's enlisted on enlisted or officer on officer. Um, looking at the chart, you can see that there was an incident where it was an officer as the victim and an enlisted as the accused offender. Sorry, where does it tell you it's enlisted versus officer? I'm sorry. So if you look, um, the rank E dash and then a number it means yeah. that it was an enlisted, and the rank O dash a number is officer. Is officer. Got yes. It. So it is the same way where you start at E101 and you go up to E8 or O607. Um, so, and then the last rank, the last column there is about referrals. We always make referrals that are appropriate for the survivors coming forward, whether that be the VA, if they have deployed and they have that veteran status. The vet center will see members of the Vermont National Guard, regardless of if they deployed for MST, military sexual trauma. And um, we also work closely with all of the Vermont network programs. So we'll make referrals out to them as appropriate as well. Um, so the first two charts are both listed out in that same fashion. What does medically separated mean in the disposition on the second to last one? So um, that means that the, uh, the accused in that case went up for a medical separation prior to the... Oh, separation from the guard? Yes. Oh, okay. That, that, oh, yeah, the two were oh. medically separated. Yes. Uh, victim and, uh, <laughs> That's like separated at birth. <laughs> no, so, so we call it separated okay, not, from the military. Yeah. You were discharged with the military, or yeah. with a medical, yes. Yeah, okay, got it. So I'll go over that third chart to just kind of give you oh, a little sorry. bit more of an information on, because it is laid out differently, just so that it makes more sense, because if you look at it, it doesn't make a whole lot of sense. So it's, a, it's all of the pending unrestricted cases or cases that have closed since the last report that we made to you all. So the first case is a carryover from 2017, which the case number is 00315. The incident happened in 2017. It was an unrestricted report with abusive sexual contact as the uh, reported offense type. Um, and so then the disposition for this case was that NGB uh, had OCI come in and investigate. That was the survivor's preference. And the, um, the accused offender was issued, uh, the, so the case was substantiated by OCI. And then That's the- a, Want to explain what OCI is? No, it's office the, or something. It's the Office of Complex Investigations. It was that, tra that team of specially trained judge advocates or um, those with law enforcement background from NGB. Uh, National Guard Bureau. Um, so they substantiated, they said that there was enough evidence to show that yes, this happened. And then the, we were able to issue him 
the accused offender a general officer memorandum of reprimand, which is a. It's just I just people are wondering what that ding dong is and the red light going off. That means the house is going into a roll call vote. That's all it means. It doesn't uh, mean we have to. It isn't red. I didn't like, see the red light. Red light. <laughs> red light. Red light. No, it's just they're going into a for a roll call. Vote. Okay. I just wanted to assure people that I saw some worried looks. Um, <laughs> and today, I assumed that it was not a big deal because none of you were rushing out. Yeah. I didn't see the red you light. That your, it's changed. good. You took your cue from us. <laughs> we're calm, relaxed. Um, so he was issued the GOMAR, which is the general letter, general officer memorandum of reprimand that stays in his personnel file. Um, and then there was also a formal process called a withdrawal of federal recognition, which is a board of um, officers who sit and the decision to um, characterize their discharge before they are separated from the military and if they're going to strip the officer of their rank before of their commission before they are separated. Um, in this case, the reported offender was separated with an under other than honorable discharge, which is the most um, significant response that we can have as a Vermont National Guard due to um, jurisdictional restraints. So separating somebody with an other than honorable is a pretty, pretty big deal. So it, it just as that goes into his, his or her civilian life, that is the only trigger on his or her record that would indicate there had been an, some issue? Um, is that I mean, it I, I goes on a resume, right? Yes. I mean, I, 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 people can ask about it. I mean, how do you, how do civilian employers know there's been an issue once they've been separated? Uh, I, I'm certainly going to answer that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, it would be, Just identify yeah, yourself for the uh, I'm uh, Kathy Caffron, I'm a state judge advocate. So, as you indicated, in normal circumstances, an employer may ask, were you in the military and what was the discharge characterization? And they would have to report other than honorable. Uh, other than that, the employer would have to go through their normal background check procedures uh, where they would uh, request the official information from the military. And just to follow up on that, they would only get that from the military. They, that there wouldn't be any other indication in a, in a background check that were to be listed? Correct. So the action is an, it's basically like an employment action. Rather, it's not a criminal. We do, we're not standing up a criminal court, so right. it wouldn't yeah. show on a NCIC uh, hit. Uh, wouldn't show up on anything like that. It's a, an employment action, just as if they were uh, fired by another government agency. Say uh, they were a federal civilian employee, and their standard form 50 uh, or whatever the state equivalent would be would show the negative employment action. Thanks. And then to kind of close out that section, in FY19, we did not receive any reports from our members serving in a federalized Title 10 status. So nobody that was serving in an active duty status reported any sexual assaults during the FY19. Just a question. What's the difference between discharged and dropped from roles? So dropped from roles is basically you come to the end of your uh, time in service, and um, it's kind of like just no, not quite. Okay. <laughs> it's it's uh, Captain Caffrey again. So drop from the rolls is a very specific type of uh, separation from the military. For those who find themselves incarcerated for long periods of time, they are administratively on the enlisted end reduced to E1, the lowest grade, and then they're kicked out with an uncharacterized discharge. So they are, those are the folks that are uh, absent for us for a long period of time based on interactions with the civil authorities. That's, that's even less good than being dishonorably discharged. Uh, no, so uh, <laughs> it's all bad. It's all bad. So other than honorable, if someone is, if an enlisted service member is uh, re separated as other than honorable discharge, they are also reduced to E1 grade uh, for for enlisted ranks. Since the regulations are different for officers. Dishonorable is a discharge characterization that can only be handed down by a court martial. So that's why you don't see those, and that's why Ms. Lazell said that we have jurisdictional restraints because we don't have uh, uni uniform code of military justice jurisdiction to bring them to a court martial to dishonorably discharge them. Right, so less than 
other than honorable is very different than I'm getting dishonorable. It. Correct. Yeah. Yes. Okay. So now we're going to move on to the sexual harassment portion of the report, uh, which is beginning on page six. During FY19, the Vermont National Guard received no sexual harassment cases. The Vermont National Guard did receive those two reports of sexually offensive incidents. Um, again, just as a reminder, those are incidents that are sex-based incidents that don't rise to the level of informal or formal resolution requests. And none of these cases included a formal discrimination resolution requests. Uh, the decision on how this is handled is based on the affected person, and both incidents were handled um, through leadership inquiry. So both of the uh, affected persons felt that the leadership intervention was enough. They didn't need to go forward with any informal or formal complaints. So if you look on to page seven, there's the graph depicting the number of incidents, informal and formal resolution requests. That's okay. Uh, that's right. But in, in two, you said there were no incidents in 2019, but we have a rape, abusive sexual contact, and sexual assault. So I guess I'm not clear. Still on from the time. They were reported. Ah, uh, that's only when they reported. Two of them occurred then in 19. So I guess I'm not fully understanding. So those were the under the, the sexual assault. Yeah. Page. Oh, okay. So Sorry, if you so look so you on, on page seven, seven. yes. Okay. Uh, Yes, so those those three were under the sexual assault umbrella. Right, and now we're and, moving on. Yes, ma'am. Um, so the first chart there shows you our incidents, our informal and our formal resolution requests that we've received by the fiscal year in which they occurred in. Uh, you'll notice that the sexual harassment reports are a little bit different than sexual assault because they're not going to be historical reports due to the reporting nature and those timelines that are set in place by the EEOC, the, fa the federal EEO commission. Um, there's such short timelines that it's not going to cross back into um, historical reports. This may be kind of a silly question. How do you unintentionally leave a voicemail um, so uh, he thought uh, that he thought that he hung up and put the phone uh, in his uh, pocket and, and kept hadn't phone. actually hung up and okay. kept talking after that he that he hung up. So yes, that gets into the next chart on the the second chart on page seven. Um, it gives you more in, uh, information on those two incidents that we received. Um, they're laid out the same way as the sexual assault report. So that first line is case 1901 which occurred in 2019. It was a female civilian with a male E5. Um, the male E5 unintentionally left a voicemail with directed sexually offensive comments. And the way that this was handled was that the commander successfully facilitated a meeting between the affected person and the accused and submitted that NGB form 333-1, which is how we track that there was a sex-based incident that occurred but it didn't rise to that level, so the commander fills it out and says this is how we handled it, and the affected person was okay with the leader's intervention. And then uh, in the next line, you'll see that there is the students from the Connecticut Army National Guard and the New Jersey National Guard. That's because that occurred at the Regional Training Institute, so our schoolhouse, where we have students from all over the country who can come to attend those classes. So we'll handle it within our um, State before they go home. So during FY19, the Vermont National Guard received no reports of discrimination, hazing, or bullying based on sexual orientation. And with that, we'll move into Chapter 3, which starts on page 9. Uh, can I, before you go there, I just have to say, uh, I'm sure that there are incidents and things that go unreported that people still feel uncomfortable about reporting or they just don't. But I have to say for a, a group of 3,000 people, 920 full-time, and they're at, this, this is an amazingly low number of incidents. Um, so I think there, it, it looks to me like there really is a cultural change going on. I, I, I just, if we took a town of 3,000 people, um, my guess is you'd have more more complaints than this. So I just 
We get at that, um, hoping the trying to target it at the lowest level at that early sexism and those comments and those jokes, and we're trying to train the force to step up and intervene when those kinds of things are being said. So the hope is that those those lower level leaders are hearing things and they're saying that's not how we behave here. So it doesn't have the ability to grow and to become an actual reportable incident. But it also then impacts those. 2,000 people who are not, I mean, in their, in their other lives, because they, right. I would assume, because they are now getting um, told that that isn't appropriate behavior right. in the guard, but it also isn't appropriate behavior in their communities. And so it's having a ripple in effect, I would think. We're making that, um, when we do our in annual mandatory training, we're making that as a point for our advocates to speak about the fact that some people just don't have positive role models in their life or they've never seen what a healthy relationship is or what healthy consent is or what what's, what is okay in a sexual relationship. And so we're really trying to have that conversation to give our soldiers and airmen a safe space to come forward and, hey, come have that conversation with us. If you've never seen it or maybe you don't even realize that will say this is against policy and regulation and it's not okay to be doing this and you don't understand why, come talk to me about why it's not okay. I, I am more than willing to come down and have coffee and let's, let's have a conversation because this is the place to do it rather than having you do something that you don't realize is not okay. Yeah. Do you have many of those informal conversations? I do. Um, we, we make it um, so that there is more of a conversation based in that training because sitting there with a PowerPoint and me clicking through a slide isn't going to get as much. Where if I ask, well, how do you feel about this? Or what are your thoughts on this topic? You tend to get more engagement and if other people in the training are engaging, they're going to remember it. And then I do have people who ask to stay after the training and just, hey, you mentioned this and I've never heard that before. What What is the deal with this? And so I'll stay after and just, kind of talk through whatever they didn't know or whatever um, piece of information they'd like to hear. And your point, is, uh, this is uh, Greg Knight. Ma'am, your, your point is valid. It is a unreported, uh, vastly underreported um, crime, or in our case, a violation of, of discipline. It's an aberrant act. Uh, knowing that, and again, this comes back to having an organizational assessment, and one of the underlying reasons here, and it may be a byproduct of this assessment, um, what they found in other states is that victims are more willing to come forward when there's somebody who's objective and not from their home state. So I expect that there may be uh, unreported instances of sexual harassment or sexual assault. We're good with that um, because I think if we bring that out um, and we can pursue, given the timeline, those perpetrators, it again sends that message of prevention and, and provides us a deterrent. So moving into our organizational assessment, uh, the National Guard has developed an assessment strategy based on three measures of effectiveness that our program runs on. So measures of effectiveness are kind of those lines of effort. So what are we doing to make a difference? Um, and they're pursued through measures of performance, which is we look at our trainings or our events that we put on. This is based on uh, military information operations doctrine, which is also similar to a public health initiative. So kind of think of the, like the anti-smoking uh, that the CDC put out. It's targeted at specific individuals and there's different processes along the way that that's how they check to make sure that it's working. That's the same idea that we've applied to sexual assault and sexual harassment uh, intervention and prevention. So these areas that we look at are designed specifically to target protective factors or risk factors for sexual violence that have been identified by the Center for Disease Control. We have the full list of those protective and risk factors on page 22 in the addendum. So if you're more curious about what that list is from the CDC, it's listed there. So the first measure of effectiveness that we have is to inform the Vermont National Guard service members of how to create a climate where all members feel valued in order to promote well-being, connectedness, readiness, and lethality. So on the bottom of page nine, you can see an example of the efforts, the target audience, and which protective or risk factors that we were targeting with that event. So when you're looking at the targeted and risk factor, or the prevention and risk factors, 
um, the prevention factors are marked with a plus sign and the risk factors are marked with a negative sign. So those negative behaviors that we don't want them to do or the positive behaviors that we do want to encourage our members to take part in. Um, so this whole chart is laid out where the event um, in the first row is the annual mandatory training, which I spoke about a little bit. That target is to hit every single service member that we have. And then what we looked at specifically picking up on in the, that event was to increase the empathy and concern that our service members have. So having those conversations about how to intervene when you see something happening. Um, and then some of the negative risk factors that we look at targeting are the institutional support. So having leaders step up and say, yeah, no, that's not okay. That's not what we do here. Making sure that it's not something that's culturally okay. And then the general tolerance for sexual violence and the weak community norms. So that's what our annual training tended to target this year. Um, and then you can look through that list and see more of the events that we did throughout the entire fiscal year. So then the second measure of effectiveness is listed on page 10, and that was to protect survivors of sexual assault serving in the Vermont National Guard by providing a trauma-informed response from initial report through resolution in order to promote survivor confidence and resilience. So this chart is laid out in the same way that the first measure of effectiveness, or it's laid out differently than the first measure of effectiveness. This one, it shows you what the event was, and then there's a description of the assessment or what that event actually looked like. So the first example is the lean-in campaigns. We did the lean-in circles um, in multiple locations. At um, We tried to have them a monthly. Um, at the end of the month, we sat down, and you have a group of individuals come, and there's a specific topic, and you discuss that topic. And it's based on the book by Cheryl Sandberg. Um, and so that's kind of what we used as our framework. And then our third measure, or in that second measure of effectiveness, there was one other um, effort that I wanted to specifically talk about, and that was our Sapper Council. Uh, that's a group that we have of survivors who meet quarterly to provide input on program updates, policy changes, um, and other organizational improvements that could be helpful to survivors who are maybe haven't come forward yet or survivors who are currently going through the process from the people who've been there, who have gone through it already. Um, when I was interviewed for that organizational assessment, that was something that I talked about, and they were blown away at the fact that we were doing this. They had never heard of it before. It was an idea that we got from the Vermont Network, actually, because they have survivors who come in and talk about what they're changing, and we were like, it's a great idea. Why wouldn't we do that? And so we've been meeting for about a year now, and it's gone very well. And are the, uh, how, what percent of survivors stay in the guard? I don't. I think we've had, of the ones who report, most of them will stay in through the end of their contract or for their full 20 years. And so the Sapper Council is mostly people who have stayed enlisted. Mm -hmm. it, uh, yes, ma'am. Any civilians opportunity, uh, survivors who then left, and then would they be able to serve on that? So for an example of that is, um, we have one survivor that sits on the council who I believe will be getting out of the military soon just because her life has changed. She's had a child and so things have just gotten a little bit more difficult. Um, so she, she will still be welcome to come in. We also have a survivor who um, we've invited the mother of a soldier who had gotten out and committed suicide and um, after they were out and the mother was going through the things and found that there was paperwork about the fact that the soldier was sexually assaulted during the military service. So we've invited that mom to give that perspective to kind of remind us that it's not just the soldier who's assaulted who's affected by this, it's also the, the larger community and the family members as well. So it is not just soldiers and airmen, it's also um, parents and civilians. And, yes, ma'am. This trauma has a ripple effect, sadly. Yes, ma'am. So we also conduct um, inspection programs, and during those, the units must demonstrate that they're meeting certain regulatory and state-based standards. Um, 
Let me go back. I realized I missed that third MOE, the measure of effectiveness, so we'll go back to that. Um, the third measure of effectiveness is to engage the Vermont National Guard sexual assault and legal systems to ensure that the program and offender accountability are in order and to promote justice, efficiency, and effectiveness. So this chart is laid out the same way that the second measure of effectiveness was. Um, but the first example on that is the Vermont Domestic Violence Council. So the victim advocate coordinator and I go down to uh, actually right next to our pavilion bu building quarterly and sit on the Domestic Violence Council and um, are able to kind of have that community relationship and learn more about how this all is, is all connected. And now we'll move on to that inspection. Um, so the inspection programs are set up to ensure that units are meeting certain regulatory and state-based standards. Uh, in previous years, the Vermont National Guard struggled with maintaining the required number of victim advocates, and that is still true this year if you look at the charts on page 12 and 13. Um, we, as the Army side, are required to have 26 victim advocates. We currently have 19 credentialed advocates, but we also have 13 who are identified and are at different phases within the credentialing process. This credentialing process is the main reason that we have so much trouble with getting the soldiers into the slots that we are required because there's a local background check and then we submit it to the National Guard Bureau for a national level background screening and then they have to attend an 80 hour course and then we have to wait for the next quarterly um, council to decide on if they're going to approve this person to be an advocate. So in that time frame where we're credentialing somebody, they could take a position at a different unit. So now they're credentialed for a unit that we've already had four or five advocates at and we have a vacancy. So it's a problem that we've had. And it's a National Guard um, credentialing program as opposed to a state? So we are credentialed through the National Organization for Victims Assistance or NOVA, it's a civilian credentialing agency that also credentials the military victim advocates. I think we have some problems with that same credentialing in our civilian. I think that might be something we need to look at. Yes. We it have is. a problem with credentialing in lots of areas. Yeah. Yes. But th th we might have to look at that. Let's yeah. take a new truth. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, So the checklist that we follow for that inspection is for the SAPR program, the sexual assault program is listed on page 19, and then for the EO University program it's listed on page 26. But that lays out all of the requirements that the units have to follow every year. Um, then we also have an organizational climate survey. It's what General Knight mentioned where commanders are expected to um, provide this opportunity to soldiers within the first uh, six months of taking command and then every 24 months after that. It is mandatory for the commanders to give this survey. However, it is optional for soldiers for, um, to actually participate in the survey. Um, the Air Force also does this survey. So even though we're providing this opportunity for them to provide feedback, a lot of people just don't do it. So it's there as an option. The, the assessment itself poses 56 questions. Um, that measure 21 different factors. And of those factors, nine of them relate to organizational effectiveness, six of them relate to equal opportunity and fair treatment factors, and then another six about <coughs> sexual assault. So um, it is a big survey. So, so sorry, what, what response rate do you actually have? I guess I'm not seeing that. I understand not everybody responds, but what is your response rate? Am I just missing it? Oh, 60%. Is that right? <coughs> Greater than. From there. So that's, that's the unit risk inventory, which is a different organizational assessment tool. Do you happen to know what the? I think we have it varies by unit. It does. Um, there's kind of a rule of thumb, and, and I was speaking to the folks at NGB. If you get north of 30%, you're doing really well yeah. um, for a survey. And, and one of our challenges is, is uh, I keep hearing it, survey fatigue. Because I see a lot of surveys, unit risk inventory, organizational climate assessment, and now I'm, I'm bringing up one that's going to be organization wide. So we're going to encourage people to participate because for me, um, we want to make the organization better. I hope folks would want to be a part of that. If there's an issue down the road, you didn't vote if you didn't do the survey. Chocolate always works. 
Well, <laughs> we can facilitate that. Walker, I'm going to Please, if you take this one. Yes. <laughs> Just saying. <laughs> and it's cheap after Halloween. <laughs> um, so, yes, that one I don't have the actual numbers, but we can definitely get that to you from the state employment manager. Before you go, before you go to state, I can, I can speak for my battalion, which is between three and 500 soldiers, was over 70% response oh. on the last survey that we did. You took. got that gold star. I didn't get the gold star, <laughs> man, but uh, our battalion commander did, I think. So. Great. Um, so then the unit risk inventory, which is a different survey that is specifically for soldiers. It's only given on the Army side. The air doesn't take the same survey. It looks at soldiers' risky behaviors, such as alcohol and drug use, or delinquency, sexual risk taking, and suicidal behaviors. That is, um, so that is completed at a higher than 60% rate because it's given at the soldiers' med medical readiness check that they have to do every year. So before they can sign up from their medical readiness check, it's in their packet, they have to hand it in. Oops, sorry. Um, well, that's why it's 98%. Yes. Uh, I have never seen this word, ideation. Suicidal ideation? Is that actually a word? Yeah. Yes, so it's, yeah. they're, they're thinking about no, it. They realize what it is. Yeah. 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 It's I have never seen it. Oh my goodness! My it's a new, you know, every day you learn new things. That's my new word. It's not quite as exciting as that. No, I'm not quite. As exciting. But that's good for Scrabble or Yeah. It has a hell of a lot too long for Scrabble. But all those vowels have like no value. So you know, the length of the word counts. <laughs> So in the unit risk inventory, there are, the Center for Disease <coughs> Control has identified 12 risk factors associated with sexual violence. So if these risk factors are in place, there's a higher likelihood that a sexual assault or sexual violence in general will, will occur. Mm -hmm. Of those 12, the unit risk inventory just happens to measure four of them, which are listed out, um, the questions that relate to those risk factors are listed out on page 14. And we have the percentages of the response rate. So um, this year, for FY19, 4% of our soldiers showed that they had some sort of alcohol disorder. 6% rode with a driver who's under the influence, and it goes down from there. Um, and so you can see the trend from FY16 through FY19 on the responses from those questions. Did these, did these surprise you at all? I think I was happy to see that they've gone down. Um, that was the thing we've. Yeah. 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 Except for the songs that have stayed the same. But yes. Um, not practicing safe sex is interesting that that's basically stayed the same. <coughs> so that's the the questions that relate to that are um, if they've uh, if they have one one sexual partner wear a condom or use birth control. That's right. what that question asks. Uh, so, so they're saying no. Um, so that's, again, the, they just don't really have that other place where they've learned about these things. So it's we've kind of tried in that annual training to give some of that basic knowledge. Could work. It's <laughs> great. Um, so Finally, our program also provides regular updates to the senior leaders and key stakeholders to provide statistical data, um, as well as identify best practices or anticipated initiatives that the program would like to take. So these briefings serve as an opportunity for us to ensure that there's a shared understanding between you as a program manager and General Knight and the other senior leaders as leadership for the whole National Guard. Um, and it also holds me accountable to make sure that I'm doing what I'm supposed to be doing. So we do that on a quarterly basis. And then um, if we move on to page 15, that brings us to the addendum. So in the addendum, there's more detail on the history, definitions, evolution, and focus of our program. Um, it's here for your reference. But uh, if there's no further questions, then that completes the, this portion of the report. Any more questions? Uh, it is great. It is great. And I may I ask one question? Because I never, they never. Uh, where does your name actually appear as the author of this report? I don't know. Because I can't find it anywhere. I was going to say, I don't think I actually put my name in it. And, and how many years have you been working for the Guard? 
or in this capacity? So I was the victim advocate coordinator from right. 2016 until um, this past September. I was officially selected as a sexual assault response coordinator. I've been a member of the Vermont National Guard since 2011. I enlisted at 17 as a junior in high school. So I've been up here for a very long time. Correct. But you've been the sexual assault response <coughs> coordinator since uh, September. Correct. Because Captain Detweiler moved into the state people employment role, and then I moved into this role. Yeah. As a junior in high school, did you think you'd be doing this? I did not. I so I um, got on the conversation. My recruiter came to speak to me at the Wyndham Regional Career Center in Brattleboro, <laughs> um, and he said, "Anything you want to do." when you get out of high school, you can do in the National Guard. And I was like, well, what about psychology? Got a job for that. So I went home that day and said, hey, mom, I think I want to join the Guard. <laughs> Whole battalions of people who are ready for your help. Exactly. It's um, great. So that was, and then it's been a wonderful ride ever since then. Um, so then I do have the gender report. Um, that's yes, the, very exciting to see this. Yes. Um, so it's a little different than last year. We changed the layout to make it so it actually accurately represented the numbers that we have. Um, so on that, it's the paper um, staple one. So this is our 2020 gender brief. It's um, if we look at right into it, the first chart on page two for overall representation of women within both the Army and the Air National Guard. It compares our numbers to the numbers of the National Guard as a whole. So if you look at um, the blue and the red are the Vermont National Guard, and the gray and the yellow are the whole National Guard. Um, so we have maintained about an 8 to 2 ratio of men to women since 2015. Uh, this ratio is common to all job types, aside from combat roles, which were just recently opened up to women and the admin type positions have a higher ratio of females than males. Um. And, sorry. Andrew, do you, Greg, do you have an objective of growing that? I mean, is that one of your, of your priorities? Is, is your, one of your goals to improve that ratio? It is. Yeah, the, the challenge, ma'am, is, is just getting people into the guard. So having the education entitlement has been very beneficial. We found that 60% of new enlistees, for example, join the Army National Guard, citing that as a primary reason for joining. And we also know that young women join the Guard because of that at a, a greater rate than, than young men. Uh, similarly, in the Air Guard, I believe the number I saw yesterday was 30% uh, cite that as a primary reason for joining. But the challenge is getting more women to join. And then I think we have a lot of goodness in this organization. Um, overcoming some of the stigma that's attached to it is probably the biggest challenge. Well, tackling the right things. Climate and culture. So if we look at that next chart, that is our senior leader representation. Uh, this page breaks out the Army and the Air separately because the rate of leadership is different in both branches. Um, there is about a two to one ratio of men to women in senior leader positions in both the Army and the Air National Guard, however. Um, and there is the, the note that when somebody retires, we're still working on growing that force. However, we do have uh, a really robust number of female lieutenants right now, so there is a good hope that we'll be able to have a really robust group of female leaders in the future. Um, but we do go for the, the best qualified, not necessarily based on their gender. Um, and then the next page, uh, the chart lays out the rate of losses of both men and women. And then this chart is also broken out by Army and Air separately. Um, so you can see that it's not necessarily the women aren't leaving at a higher great than their male counterparts currently. So losses can be taken a couple ways. This is losses, choice to leave, not deaths. Right. So they're, well, that's how, it's, it's the ones who ETS, they retire, or they 
they've come to the end of their contract and they've gotten what they wanted to receive from the National Guard and decide that they're done with their time in the service. And ma'am, there, there are a number of considerations. Um, the list goes on as there are many of our people in the Guard. It could be the operational tempo, education, job, family. Um, any number of stressors impact on folks uh, and their reasons for, for deciding to not continue service with the organization. Is there an average number of years that the Vermont National Guard's <coughs> people serve? I think we're seeing a change. I don't have that, uh, the short answer at all, I don't know. Yeah. Uh, anecdotally, I can tell you, I believe there's a change generationally. Um, my generation, you're in it for the long haul, uh, for a lot of folks. If you look at the, at the age demographic and you look at kids now, uh, we have an event we call Crossroads. Every six months, we will meet with soldiers who are separating, and the Air Guard has a similar program. You talk to everybody who's separated from the service, and in, in a number of instances, I got my educational benefits. Thanks for the experience. I'm done. Yep. And they may come back later, um, and, and that's fine. But that's that's their choice. And you have a requirement to serve for four years after they are educated. With, with, with the education title, yes, ma'am. So if it's a, it's a two years of service for one year of college. Right. Yep. So at the end, you have a four-year education. You owe the guard four years here or another state. It's, it's a yeah, transferable entitlement. Yeah. yeah. So on the next page, we felt that it was important to highlight our 2019 Military Women's Workshop. So because the event was in November of 2019, that's actually fiscal year 20. So in the larger um, legislative report, it'll be included next year in those tables with the measures of effectiveness and measures of performance. Um, but in the gender report, we thought it was a really important event to highlight. So. Um, this event hosted about 200 women from both the Air and the Army National Guard. It had civilians, which um, are the Title V Federal Technicians, Title 32, which means that they are um, serving as well as being a technician, so the, the technicians that tend to wear their uniforms full time. We have state employees and also contractors who attended, so it was a wide array of individuals. Uh, during the event, we followed the appreciative inquiry model, uh, which allows us to begin with a focus on what is your ideal organization? What, what is the best possible Vermont National Guard that we could have? And then you work your way backwards from there. So what are some attainable and targeted steps that we can take to get to that ideal? Um, and the result came with these tw 12 main recommendations that are listed on the bottom of the page. And you'll notice that it's not gender-based, as he was saying. It's just, as an organization, how can we be better? And then on the last page of the report, we included our conclusions, which were, um, we thought were important to lay out. So um, 85 to 15% ratio is consistent between the Vermont Air National Guard and the Vermont Army National Guard when comparing the specific rank structures. Um, there is room for improvement, uh, as it, there is in any organization. So we opened the combat roles to females with some exceptions based on the leader first policy where you have to have somebody that's mid grade in that unit before you can actually have somebody off the street and list into the organization. So it's asking females who've already got their career path set to put their career on hold and change their whole career path. Um, also targeted recruiting campaigns strive to assess 16% or more women each year in order to begin to increase the overall representation. Um, and then recommendations for senior leaders were to set specific benchmarks for annual recruiting and overall representation and support those benchmarks by implementation and, res um, and resourcing those 12 recommendations. So we've got them, now let's actually do something about it. Great, good start. And then pending any of your other questions, that's our 2020 gender report. Thank you. Uh, any so I guess my make the, you did point this out. It's my bottom line question is, are we doing better than we were before? And it seems like for that one graph, that the answer is yes. Yes. Are you doing as good as you wanted to do? I think that I'm always one of those, let's strive for the next level. I'm, let's 
not settle for where we're at, let's keep getting better. I think every organization should be that way so you don't stagnate. And I saw the other in general shake his head. We're not where we want to be. We're not there yet. We're making great strides, but we're not there yet. Yes. And some of it's simply institutional challenges, um, as, as Christina was referring to. The, the Army has given us what they call the Leaders First program. So to flesh that out a little bit, we historically have not, we're, we're probably half of our force structure is an infantry brigade combat team. The predominant specialties within that organization were open only to men. So it was only probably two and a half years ago that changed. But instead of saying it's open to women and, and deferring to <laughs> commanders and, and senior non-commissioned officers to take care of the integration, they gave us a structure. And the structure was you need an E5 or above, a sergeant or above, two of them in the organization that were women before you can recruit off the street and put somebody into that organization. So we're doing this now one company at a time. So if you look at a platoon, a company, a battalion, a brigade, it's, it's a very user level. Right. It's incremental and it's excruciating because I know we can do better. Um, but having that, so be like Lieutenant Stein went to school for how many weeks to become ordinance? So 16 weeks. So 16 weeks of school to establish your career path. And if we reach in and say, hey, the needs of the service, Lieutenant Stein, you have the skill set, we want you to become an infantry or cavalry or armor officer, we're going to send you back to school for 17 weeks. What do you think of that? It's, it's hard. Um, so once we get those open, I think we're going to start seeing a, a little better traction in improving our numbers in the combat arts. Anybody else want to make some comments? <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. This is really good. Congratulations, guys. I just I have one question, which is the gender report. Are we embedding that? I hope in the sexual harassment report, particularly with <coughs> all these areas you're going to be tracking to continue to improve. It would be really helpful to have a chapter. Well, it's know, a separate we, report, but it is required. But, it's, it's so it's ongoing. Actually, it's, but, it's not required by legislation, but I think, we, if I remember we, correctly, there's it may become part of this. Yes, I would hope it would just become part of it, so that it was. I mean, it's both pieces of culture. It sort of it almost maybe ought to take on a different name now that we. Uh, I, I would differ with you. I think that it should be that there should be a gender um, report every year, but I don't think it should be part of the sexual harassment report because sexual harassment is different than gender equality. And and I don't think they should be combined into one report. I think that they, and that's just my personal opinion. You can do with it as you want, but I, I agree with that. Yeah, if we Sorry. include the gender report, it makes it sound like we're saying that sexual assault and sexual harassment are a women's issue. Yeah, right. and they're not. So, but I'm glad to hear we're continuing to, to do it because I think it's very helpful and informs the, the culture change discussion because we're still, the eight to two ratio is still not so great. But kudos, I think, to all of you boys. This is good improvement and thank you for establishing such clear priorities and culture um, and leadership. When, um, on Friday when you looked at this and I, I put it on the agenda here because I thought we could really look at, um, there were a few things that, suggestions that, of tweaks that could be made. I think we, the decision I think was that we didn't have time to actually develop a code of ethics this year, but that there were some just tweaks that could be made and I, oh, I was clear off that. Sorry, it on Friday, wasn't Oh, I thought. Well, we didn't make it. A, my, what I would remember as of, from last Friday is there seemed to be a growing consensus that we would look at S198, which, which is the bill that instructs the Ethics Commission to come back with the Enforceable Code of Ethics, which is different than the other bill, which gives them more, all the more powers right away. And that's what um, Paul Burns testified to that from VPIRB, and Larry Novitz testified to that. I forget who else spoke, if anybody else spoke. 
What was your understanding? What was your understanding? Oh, my, uh, well, I guess I'm not because this clear is the two of you are. I thought my understanding was that we, we didn't need another year and that we were, that, that Larry had done enough work so that we could look at what his proposal was and that we were would actually think about doing more this year. I thought, I thought differently. Okay. I'm not saying you're wrong. Well, you were it's not to right or wrong. That's not what I, that's not the way I remember it. Okay. Right. I concur with Senator Plinger. Uh -huh. I was just living in the boat. Okay. But there were, yeah. There were some music. There were some things that Paul Burns and Deeper put on the table. Right. I don't know whether, do you have any of Paul's she the company? Paul is scheduled to be testifying in um, House Go Ops on a corporate constitutions ban at the same time. He chose House of Ops over us. He finally took up the bill after <laughs> quite a lot of time. So yes. he was quite eager. After two years or something, yes. Yeah. And well, Betsy, you have to be gone. That's where I have to go to do a walk. And I and is that for now? I'm waiting for the email. It will be in a few minutes. Okay. Probably. Okay, so Anthony? I was also asked to go to do the, introduce the bill to the House Committee, but I prefer to stay here. I mean, if I can do that, I'd rather wrap this up. They don't need me to introduce the corporate contribution bill to the House. It's pretty. And Sarah Copeland Hansis and I had a conversation about it at noon today. Okay. And told her that Betsy is the brain behind it. So. Right. I did ask somebody from the Progressive Party who's helped develop the bill to show up at House GovOps in case they have wanted his opinion, his questions. Because I, I would rather work on this and resolve this. Right. Could I ask Larry Jones whether he's remembering sure. the same conversation? Yeah. Yeah, yeah I, my memory from last Friday was that um, there was not a pressing concern to adopt a code at this time, that the focus of the conversation would be S-198, and should we pass S-198 asking the Ethics Commission to submit a code to you in the fall, um, and we support that. And I should identify myself for the record, Larry Novins from the Ethics Commission. Uh, and we, we, we this, Julie, Julie Hallberg. Yeah, I was here. And yeah. that's your understanding? Yes. yes. That's why I recall. Yeah. All right. We'd be very happy to move forward. We yeah, go. I, think, I think we're all saying this with a tiny bit of regret. In yeah. Sense. yeah. You know, I guess maybe I'm just channeling you, the regret. Yeah. <laughs> you know, Sorry. it's taken a while to get to this point, and I think we'd all like it to move faster, but as we all experienced a year or two ago, when we brought the stronger bill out, it really got yeah. taken apart just by the Senate. So it makes more sense, I think, to step back and take this step by step. I would really hate to bring something to the floor that, it, that we're not ready to do it and have it get taken apart. I, I agree with you because I think that we need to, whatever we come up with, whatever you present and that we can agree on here, we need to be so clear in our understanding of exactly what it means that, or it will just, we, we need to, you really, and I don't know that we have the time before, um, because we have one, two, three weeks left before crossover. I don't think we can do this in three weeks. Because I think what it would mean is developing a code of ethics along with other parts of the bill that gives the extended powers, but we, we, we bring a code of ethics up to the Senate floor, people start going through it. I have a feeling there would be a lot of room for questions to be raised about different parts of it, we, even if we felt pretty good about it. Mm -hmm. So we need and to really do I think we need to like, give people more time to understand what we're doing. So given that, did were there changes to this the way it was written that you talked about? And did VPIRG have, you said, he, Paul had some very specific suggestions. Yeah, that he, to strengthen 198, he had four suggestions. And uh, Larry yeah, had I some suggestions, that. too. In general, one thing we talked about was the intent that the Ethics Commission would develop a code of ethics along with some 
input from stakeholders as well. I don't know if we say that in the bill or whether it's just assumed. So that when we do come back with the code of ethics, it would be something that advocates had agreed on. I don't see any reason why we would be, we shouldn't, I don't see any reason why we shouldn't be vetting this right. as broadly as we can. As Senator Clarkson said last week, um, you know, I, and I agree, I think it really is up to the General Assembly to have ownership over the bill. Yeah. Um, and we'd be most happy to provide whatever opportunity anyone within the General Assembly or outside the General Assembly wants to um, input. Uh, and assist in the drafting of this. I think what we have is a good beginning. I'm sure there will be areas where people feel that it's too weak or maybe areas where it's too specific and we can deal with those. And uh, at the very least, um, at the very end of it, we can present a good draft and if there are differences of opinion, there may be, um, there will be plenty of people who I'm sure will be willing to step forward and say, you need a more specific point here. Um, mm -hmm. My hope is that we're all on the same page in, in realizing the state of Vermont needs a statutory code of ethics because what we have now just does not work. Um, the problem with the code of ethics that was adopted by the commission is it doesn't have the force of law. Uh, when we are asked to give advice or to render another advisory opinion, it would be based on what we have now, which doesn't have the force of law, which means that anybody could take our advice and say, uh, fine, thanks for your advice, but I'm not gonna follow it. Um, so that's one problem. Another problem is I testified before, I think the first time I came here this year was January 10th, and one of the problems we have is that the code of ethics provisions as they deal with government employees are somewhat broader and different from the provisions that the Department of Human Resources has in its personnel manual and policies what the professional responsibility had, board has for lawyers. So things that would normally be considered um, improper conduct for people in state government don't have a remedy anywhere else because they don't have equivalent uh, provisions within their codes. And as we know also, the uh, Department of Personnel, uh, I mean, so Department of Human Resources Personnel Manual, it also doesn't have the force of law. The executive order, which governs executive branch appointees and personnel, doesn't have the force of law. Um, so we should join um, the vast over 40 other states who do have a statutory basis for judging governmental conduct. Um, the advantages of it would be, I think, um, more trust in government. If they believe that we are all serious and take ethics seriously, I think that breeds trust in government. And, and along with uh, dealing with a code of ethics is the, the whole idea of transparency about what we're doing. And this statewide code of ethics, at least as we have envisioned as we have envisioned it so far, is fairly general. It's not radically different from the code that the commission has adopted, although it's getting better with each look that we give it. We had a meeting this morning and talked about a couple of things that <coughs> following the draft that I gave you last week and the early one right. I gave you in January um, would be improvements. So yeah. um, it's, it is definitely a work in progress and there are a couple of areas that I've identified that I believe we can really uh, provide better work, not better work, but uh, better language for uh, you to consider and, and then vet those things as broadly as possible. So I absolutely support the, uh, the notion that we should have a code of ethics. Um, one of the things, whether it's passed in this form or in a different form, would be the question of uh, exactly how far, you know, who should it apply to right now as drafted, it applies to executive branch and legislative non-core um, functions and that makes perfect sense. I don't know, and there may be room to include um, judicial branch employees, not judges, mm -hmm. but clerks, people who work, you know, like anyone else does in administrative, excuse me, uh, positions, non-policy making decisions, that there may be a way to include them. We don't, I don't think that will affect this in any way at this time, and it's a conversation we could have later on. 
Um, it's quite possible the judiciary, I'm imagining a scenario where somebody in a courthouse somewhere did something unethical. They scheduled their friend's trial ahead of someone else's trial, something like that. Um, which would be, I think, by anyone's definition, an ethical violation. The question would be, okay, well, where should that be dealt with? Should it be the Ethics Commission or someone else? And it may be that judicial branch will take that and deal with it, and if that's the way it is, that's fine. It may be that the judicial branch would say, hey, Ethics Commission, we have no objection to you doing a hearing on that and reaching uh, some conclusions and either taking action if there's authority to do that or referring it back to the judiciary where they could do that. So there, we've got, the options are all over the place and I think we should keep all those doors open as we move forward. But the basic notion of the need for a code, I hope, is incontrovertible. So we don't need to put any of that in here, like about no. the, and working with human resources and all that kind of stuff because that that's what you're going to do to develop the code anyway. Absolutely. Yeah. I okay. want to bring something to you in the fall that has that's been well vetted. And if there are arguments against it, we know what they are, and they're well articulated, and then you're in a position of making the decision. Larry, can you just talk a little bit about the intersection of the legislative branch and the Ethics Commission? I mean, we have kind of a different setup, if you will, than the judicial or the executive. Yeah. Um, as I understand it right now, well, as the, the current law exists, if we get a complaint against a legislator, we refer it to the Senate or the House Ethics Panels, and they follow their procedure. Um, as I understand this draft, and as I imagine an ethics code in my mind, le core legislative policy-making decisions would not be included in that. What okay. would be included would be the things like um, you know, use, you know, stealing from the state, um, you know, fraudulently filling out uh, expense forms, things like that. Um, and I haven't gone through the entire list of things that people could do wrong, but I see it as, as two separate things. And, and within an ethics code, and even the draft that I gave you already, um, is a provision that any department, anybody, the Senate, the House, or any agency or division can, is free and should be encouraged to adopt their own ethics codes. And if they're more stringent, mm -hmm. great. They should be. And so the, as we envision an ethics code, it really is sort of a bottom line, most general baseline code of conduct. I mean, we need to have something. And if individual parts of state government want to have something that's more robust, um, they're encouraged and free to do so. Yeah, I think it's really incumbent upon us to come up with a, a unified code of ethics for the entire state. And I, I agree. I mean, it's like the way we have the difference between state law and municipal overlay. Munici you know, each area could have more but not less. Right. And that we would establish uh, a unified co state code of ethics. Uh, I guess my sort of notion on Friday is that, yes, we'd go to 198 and build off 198, but that we would add substantively to 198 with Larry's uh, memo from the 30th and, and Paul B uh, Burns' memo. I don't, and hear, I don't see Larry's. Oh, here. It is. Larry's is dated. It, they look the same, but the dates are different, the uh, no, January 30th. That was my draft. What did you want to add from this? It, it's it's not in draft built build draft form. Well, it's not in the form that Betsy and Rask would put it in if she were still here. Right. Um, but it is it, that, that is roughly the form that I think it would look like. Um, what we and and what I have in there is sort of footnotes so you can see where these things came from. Right. Um, I, but some of the language is it's all open to discussion. Wait, wait, I need to I need to go back a minute here. I don't understand what was just said because 198 says develop a code of ethics right 
this says this is a draft of the code of ethics, but we don't want to put that in because, so. right, no, we don't want to put this into the bill because this is a draft of the code of oh, ethics. I, I thought you had the polls or recommendations to add. To no, I'm talking about Larry's right now. Right. Oh, Larry's I thought Larry's had some specific recommendations for how to strengthen 198. I'm sorry. Oh, no, no. No. It, okay. This is a, okay. So this and, is a preview of what you might see. Yes, right. Got it. Okay. I, I know I'm so, okay. So now, then what I would like to do is go to the recommendations that Paul made to add to 198 the, and see what we make of those. Because that, this, his recommendations here are additions to, and it looks like this. Yeah, I gave mine to Anthony. Oh, do you need another one, maybe? Well, I can just share this. Sorry. Or take Chris's. Yes. Um, so, does it make sense to start going through these no, and I see? I have a copy of that. Oh, um, okay, let's make copies. Gail, is it possible to print out two more copies yeah. of Paul's um, testimony from I'm on Friday? The 31st. Thank you. <laughs> Yeah, that would, I think that would be good because um, if, if we went through them because, okay. Um, so while we're waiting for those, then um, I have, we have a sexual harassment panel at 3.30. Okay. So I can be late. Yeah, I don't want to be a little late. Had you heard that from? Could I ask um, Paul about the timeline? On it, or is that okay? Or do you want me to wait? Larry? Oh, Larry, I'm sorry. I, Paul Prince on my mind now. Um, I think it's November 30th. Um, does that give you enough time? Oh, yes. November 15th. 15th? Yeah. Okay. Oh, yeah. And we talked about And just, Paul, uh, this is getting printed out. We, when uh, Larry referred to the ownership, the legislative ownership, which goes back to your point about how challenging this may be in the legislature. I do think we have to build in some form of sort of legislative ownership in some of this work during the course of the summer fall. Yeah. And I don't quite know how we would do that, but because it's not always a great year for a, but it would be interesting for our committee, for example, maybe, or somebody to do either a road trip um, or you know have some public hearings with some of the draft recommendations that you might be you know that you'd have mm -hmm. that we could take on the road and listen to the public on on this issue and really build some legislative ownership so that in the maybe we only did four but to do four legislators in their districts come and listen and and really build more own broad ownership in our doing this. Yeah, that would be great. Is that what you were referring to in well, terms of the legislative idea. ownership? But, well, no, I was quoting you. And, yeah, and I know, I but what did that mean? I, mean, I thought what? you meant um, that this bill needs to be not the Ethics Commission's bill, yes. but the legislature's So my bill. question is, how do we make it that yeah. if you're going off and creating this proposal and bringing it back to us, I'm, how do we then own it? I guess we own it by taking by coming to whoever the five people are that are sitting around this room next year, that they will review it in depth. And, okay. and if it passes out of here, there's legislative yeah. ownership. I don't know how else you do it. Well, well, I think the additional opportunity we may have is doing a couple public hearings on it in November or something before. before. But, but there won't be a draft. There will. Well, the, I mean, I'm supposed to give you a draft on November 15th, but oh. that doesn't mean that I can't give you something that looks very similar to what I gave you last yeah, week. A working draft. As a discussion starter. Um, and so. I just think it would be interesting know, for us to do that and yeah. hear because um, when people have been emailing me, you know, we've been inundated with emails about this, and I've been asking them back. But they're all, it's two. It's only two emails, really. It's one from Beepert and one from Champaign for Vermont. Right, but I've had right. about 30. Right. So the, the, they press the button. Right. No, I, I get that, but that's not as, right. I can't just press the button. I have to do a couple other things. I know. But <laughs> I have responded to them, and, and one of the questions I ask at the end of 
my email is what has your experience been with ethical you know have you had issues with with breach a breach of ethics in the state what's your experience been and sort of putting it back on them is to if you care so much about this what's your experience of it and I'm getting some interesting answers um, one challenge, though, with mid-November will be the whole just being on election. We none could be of us significantly, made it here. Could be significant <laughs> turnover, right? Yeah. So uh, my thought would be, you know, I'm for the idea of engaging our colleagues and the public, but uh, if that report, if there was a, a, a joint meeting in Room 11 and you write in the public in in early January, there could be a public way to make the whole wing, but there could be a lot of new people. I mean, the last cycle there were 40 new house members. Yeah. I know there would be four, or five, six people in the Senate. That's a lot of. A lot of well, we know there will be at least two new people, right? Yes. Um, right, but you know, we also are committed to this bill as us, this fivesome, and we could at least advance. And it's just something to think about. Yeah. We could advance the conversation or at least hold one or two public hearings or if we wanted. And anyway, it's just one piece of trying to build ownership in it. That's all. Well, Brian, I don't see Anthony. a reason where we, I'm sure. Oh, yeah. I think Anthony had No, a I was just going to say, it's, I have vision, hard times kind of visualizing how a public hearing would work on something like this. I think many people would support it, but I don't know if they're going to read the document and sort of talk to the document, I think they would talk more to their lack of trust in government, which I'm not saying is a bad thing to have them express, but it's just, it's not like a bill where you look at a bill and say, well, I have a problem with section four. I don't think people will read it that way. I think they'll just say, yeah, we want a code of ethics. We want, we want a strong ethics commission, but I have a hard time just visualizing how the conversation would go. Chris? Well, so to Senator Plenty's point, you know, I mean, I suppose besides publishing the draft, you, we could also develop, you know, questions we would ask people you know, yeah. like, to yeah. try to steer, to steer the conversation. For instance, your good question: Have you had, have you run into instances that made you question uh, ethics or conflict of interest, whatever it was, so that we would mm -hmm. help people provide more on target concrete feedback that could be helpful as we evaluate or whoever the next team is. Right. One of the things that I've done is in, in preparing the draft that you have already is to look at the experience of the other states in the federal right. government. And that what we helpful. have here tracks very closely what we have. And there's nothing different in this from what doesn't exist somewhere else. The language may be a little bit different. We didn't steal everything verbatim. <laughs> um, but we took a lot of it pretty darn close. Well, there's um, plagiarism and ethics thing. I'm trying to it, Well, here, the thing about <laughs> conflicts of interest in ethics is disclosure. Uh -huh. If you disclose it, you're halfway home. So I like the idea that Wisconsin is modified. Yeah, by me. Yeah. So um, my thoughts were, uh, I would be very happy to work with, I mean, I'm happy to continue my work and do what I do and, and put it on our website and invite comment. I don't know what we'll get. Oh, I'd be more than happy to work with anyone in the House or the Senate uh, who wishes to have any input on this or discuss this, or obviously ledge counsel as well. Um, and I'm happy to do that. I don't know how productive it would be to open it up, I mean, I, I have no objection to opening it up to the public, but I, I think you, your point is well taken. People are going to be more concerned about do we have a code um, than the actual specifics. I think the, that kind of nuts and bolts part of the discussion is more likely to happen here than anywhere else. Um, so I, don't know. I, I can give Digger you. Digger could do a survey. Yeah. I can give you a preview of the next draft. But uh, we're working on one section. I had a conversation yesterday with somebody pointed something out to me that I hadn't thought of. And I said, oh, that's great. I can't wait to work this through. And I'm about a third of the way there. But another few days, I'll have it. And then I'll be happy to give you. I'm happy to update you at any time as to where we are. And if WOW 198 is working its way through, um, you have any questions about what we're working on for a proposed code on all ears? more 
input I get, um, the better product we'll all have. Well, I, I like the way you've broken it down by subject area. I think that's very, uh, you can really wrap your arms around that. Can, can I suggest that um, you're going to be doing this, we're going to be getting um, a draft that this, whoever's on this committee will grapple with next year. I don't want to, there are some very specific suggestions here, and I would like to get to them before we run out of time. Before you talk about pulverizing? Yes, yeah. I would like I'm to. happy to address it. So what I would like to do is address them and see if we want them to be included in S-198 or yeah. not. Because instead of talking about the potential draft. Right. Is that okay? I'm happy to do that. So okay. the first one about giving the commission a capacity to investigate, I think that's premature. Until we have a code, um, it really doesn't make any sense to be doing investigations. Actually, before she left, uh, she, Betsy looked at this, and when she read the first one, she said she didn't think it was possible to do constitutionally. Well, it's also premature, so right. even if... So, okay. um, number two, open the proceedings once there's a determination probable cause. That would be when we get to an enf enforcement phase. That, I, I think that's also premature. Um, when the commission has determined that a violation is concerned, uh, occurred, its findings, sanctions should be publicly available. I agree with that, but again, premature. We don't need to put it in this bill. Um, and an opportunity to request an advisory opinion to be opened again. Um, we've stated our position, uh, our clear understanding of legislative intent after the first advisory opinion was that that was not considered. Um, and um, we have no desire to go down that that road again. And the bill that's in the House, H-634, has language to uh, make very clear what, in, in the language of the statute, what was apparently the original legislative intent. So that will be remedied by that. So um, those, I think, are the only... No, there's one that oh, there are more about H2. about see more doable to make yeah. the um, a limit on the time that agencies have to consider and respond to a complaint forwarded by the Ethics Commission seems appropriate. Um, I don't know that it isn't premature and, the, and not necessarily consistent with S-198. Talking about an ethics code, this really goes to enforcement complaints, so it's, I think it's a separate matter. Um, when an agency determines that a violation has occurred, it must share its findings with the Ethics Commission. Um, I don't have a position on that. I think there may be personnel issues and union issues that I'm unaware of. Again, I think this is premature. Um, requirement the Agency of Human Services take immediate steps to make it possible for members of the public to locate sections of its personnel policy and procedure. Um, the parts of their personnel procedure manual that refer to ethics thing are on our webpage. I don't see why DHR couldn't just make it more easily find it. I don't think it needs a law for that. And um, any clarification that may be necessary to ensure that statewide office holders are considered employees for the purposes of this law. I think the language of H of S-192 talks about um, branches of government and executive and legislative. So I don't know why that specific uh, definition would be necessary. You mean 198? Yeah, 198. I'm sorry if I misspoke. Um, yeah. And the proposed draft, as you see it, talks to all state employees except for judges. If we exclude other judiciary employees, it would be everybody from the snowplow driver to the whoever to the governor. So uh, some of these may or may not be good ideas. I don't think they're necessary to the efficacy of S-198. I, I agree. Um, it almost gets to the point where it's so prescriptive that it, it just, we're asking you to do a lot of work, and yet then we're going to tell you, bing, 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 bing. I think if we just let you do your work and pretty much leave it the way it is, we're in better shape. Yeah. I, I, I think that you're right that some of these might be good ideas, but they're premature. Right. Yeah. The, I mean, the fir whole first page certainly is, and the second page, the um, only one that I would have thought made some sense would be the time, and I don't know what the time is, and it might be different for different types of inquiries or different, right. um, 
So I'm I'm fine leaving that yeah. alone too for the time being. Yes, Allison. So the one thing 198 doesn't address is your continued funding. Yes, it does. It, it does. It repeals. It the postpones the uh, sunset. Yes, it I'm postpones it to year. 21. That's right. Yeah. Sorry. And we were at House uh, Appropriations last week and went through our 2021 budget, and they were happy to see we weren't asking yet for more money. Okay, great. And your total budget for 2020 for 21? I don't remember the exact number. It's it's a teeny bit less than this year's budget, um, and the reason it's less is because my predecessor had his family on the insurance. Ah, uh, right. Um, so I with his departure, I don't have those people uh, that I have to depend. So our uh, requirements are somewhat diminished. But I give you an idea of how small a budget we have that that can make a difference. <laughs> Your budget is less than half a million. We're about 120. I think it's 150 or something. Like yeah, that. I think it's closer 20. to 120. Yeah, yeah. 120. Yeah. And yours is a part-time position. Yeah. yeah. And I'm over my hours for this week, so. So how oh. many? What, what are you? Are you half or two thirds? I'm 20 hours a week. That's it. Yeah. Yeah. Jesus Christ. I also want to just back up for a minute because we're talking about developing enforceable code of ethics, et cetera. But you've already adopted something, a statement of principles. I mean, there's something that you're working on, right? I'm sure. You've already adopted some kind of statement of principles or some yeah, we have a code. towards the code. We have, I mean, the Ethics Commission was charged by the existing statute by Act 79 with coming up for a code of ethics, and they've done that. Okay. Um, and it's available and it's on our website. We have little pamphlets. I can bring it to you. Um, we're always looking at that, and since I've begun my work on a legislative code of ethics, I've seen that there are parts of our adopted code that we should change as well. Right. But we can do that easily enough. Right. And we talked about it today's meeting, and maybe by next month we'll have something else we might make a revision to. But. I think it's important to, the, the one thing that people that I hear all the time is about this advisory opinion, mm -hmm. and I think it's important to to say that if we had a if we had a, a statutory code of ethics and there was you you at that point you might be able to to take complaints from people and advise them that this is a valid complaint or it's not but that's not what we meant by advisory opinions it was very clear that an advisory opinion that was to be given by the Ethics Commission was when you get, I call you for um, and say, would this be a violation? And you you say, oh my God, that's the 17th person that's called me about that. I'm going to give an advisory opinion to, to those people who are covered that this could be considered a violation of a code of ethics. I mean, that that's what it was. It was advisory to the people who were covered. And, and I think that's, um, that was always the intent. And if we had a statutory, statutory code and we had, and the Ethics Commission has more authority or responsibility or anything, then maybe, maybe that's where you can then take, take those. It's either a complaint or it's not a complaint. It's not an yeah. advice. Well, it's, a complaint. The language that's in the House now will clarify that. So okay. that what I think your understanding has been and what ours certainly is now is that anyone who is subject to the ethics code yes. can ask for advice or opinion about their conduct, their own conduct, yes. not someone else's, and not you know to play gotcha and not uh, to weaponize it as a tool against an opponent. And I think that the, the thought was that you could give me advice, but when you when you put out an advisory opinion, it was because there were concerns by a lot of people around a particular area. And so instead of taking the 18th call from somebody, you could put out this, to all those people who are covered, this could be a conflict, or this could be, so we're advising you that you might want to stay away from it. Yeah. Okay, Chris? Yeah, but so I, it's, I hadn't really thought of it that way. I mean, I I get the whole thing of getting advice, like oh, this wouldn't be something you should go ahead and do. But I thought it was even going to be on a, you know, you were saying like 18 people, but I thought it was also available, you know, for the first person, 
like someone who is in office has some sort of opportunity and they wonder, should I accept a job like that or is it too closely related? And you could do an advisory opinion. No. It was very precisely advice to one person. As the statute reads now, it's supposed to be general. Um, so if you were, if you had a question, you could contact me and I could give you what they, the difference in the statute is guidance. 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 So guidance. I could, I could you give guidance. you that. Uh -huh. And yes. without regard to anybody else, it would be just between you and me. Yeah. If you wanted an advisory opinion, you could, you could request one. And then I could open it up and if I wanted at that point. Um, one of the things we're asking over in the House is when we do advisory opinions, is that we be allowed to say, hey, the Ethics Commission is considering whether you know owning a racetrack is consistent with being the state treasurers or uh -huh. you know doing something in, in, in government. And we might open it up to public comment. You know, it shouldn't be the executive director sitting in a room by himself thinking about these things. Um, why not? If it's if if the opinion is supposed to be based on the law and something that people can rely on. Rely on. Why shouldn't we hear the arguments pro and con? Right. Uh, ultimately, it would still be my responsibility to author the opinion, but I want to make sure that I have a well-informed fact, you know, um, big database before I work on this. Because, you know, the, the problem is if you ask me for an advisory opinion that's going to apply to everyone else. Someone else may say, well, I don't see it that way at all, and I'd want to know what the facts are before they should be So that's process. So guidance is for an individual. One of the advisory opinions are for classes or more general. Yeah. But, I, but you wouldn't offer an advisory opinion just on your own. No. It would be as a result of inquiries. I would. That's what I think we. No, I think yeah. that's the way it's yeah. that's the And that's, a, that's what right I now. think. So there's guidance. I ask you for guidance. I'm not asking you for advice. I'm asking you for guidance. Right. Is it wrong for me to to reserve a seat up there for the symphony orchestra for my family of 17? Right. Um, and you say, I don't know, but if 17 people ask you that same question, then you might say, you know, I don't think there's anything wrong with it, or yeah. that you better be careful. Or hey, you 17, how would you like an advisory opinion that's Or public. it can be it can be general yeah. at that point because it's not related to a specific right. individual. Right. I think guidance could be an earned income opportunity for the ethics commission. Larry goes into a little booth and provides guidance on individual. Right in blue glass ball. <laughs> right. Yeah, yeah, for like 50 bucks a pop. So I'm thinking of another no example, and I don't know whether anyone's called you, but for instance, I was the road commissioner of a very small town, and my brother-in-law ran a plowing company, and there were two other companies that also did, and his bid came in, Lois, is, is, that, is that the kind of thing that, would, you know, that you would be able to say, well, you can do what you want, but here's what I think? Well, my initial response is our jurisdiction is only for state government. Ah. So I wouldn't even go there, <laughs> okay? Um, then that was a bad example. <laughs> well, but I get the point. Yes. Um, well, could be you know, and and the, other, the other thing is on advice or guidance, I may. I don't have to. I could say, you know, that's an area that we just don't have any laws that address that. And I'm reluctant to even give advice about okay. that. I say you might talk to these people or these people, yeah. or here are the things you might consider, but That's I'm not going to. Yeah, yeah I, I would do that, but I'm not sure there are some circumstances I think be wrong for me to tell somebody to Gail. do something. Gail, do you have a vote? Um, so I just want to do a check a in here. Um, we're going to lose one of our members. Um, I, I mean, she's just going to leave for a little while, but. Um, oh, don't. <laughs> that was a pleasure. I don't believe that was a little pleasure. <laughs> 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 <laughs>